So now in this session I will then introduce you the notion of standard error and also in this context talk about the, the possible problems with the multicollinearity. So standard error is quite a, quite a important concept in the regression analysis. Uh, if you consider, for example, the typical regression output uh, that uh, that we that we get, then notice that uh, the standard error is typically reported right next to the coefficients. That's also if you read um, read uh, some some uh, published uh, studies or journal articles. Uh, very often, standard error is also reported. Uh, uh, together with the coefficients, perhaps in parentheses or next to it, like uh, like in this case. So, uh, purpose of this lesson is to then uh, clarify you. Okay, what is the interpretation of the standard error? What is the meaning? How to and and why it is so so critically important. So now let's come to a little bit uh, confusing part, perhaps. So. Uh, Remember this uh, closed form solution that we obtained for the multiple regression analysis. Uh, so I have here now used this uh, elegant matrix uh, notation, but uh, but don't worry if you if you if you uh, don't uh, fully understand what it means. Uh, basically, it's just this formula how your computer would calculate your your regression coefficients b when you insert your data of x and y. Okay, and so far I have systematically and many times emphasize that there is nothing random about how computer is calculating these uh, these coefficients so if you if you have some given data and you ask your if you calculate the regression coefficients with stata or with r or with excel so any software should give you exactly the same same uh, coefficients b if you do it multiple times with the same data every single time you get the same yeah, intercept and slope coefficients. So there was nothing random. It was actually optimal solution to some some well defined optimization problem. So it might sound a little bit bizarre that uh, that uh, next I'm going to claim that actually this uh, Ohls estimator B is itself a random variable. Uh, whenever we have a live class, uh, when I make this claim, then students look really puzzled. Okay, how can something that was just uh, completely deterministic uh, it was obtained as the optimal solution to some some uh, uh, well behaved problem and the computer is each and every time calculating it exactly in the same way using some simple covariances and variances how can it suddenly become a random variable i must admit that th this was also puzzling to me also for for a long time that how can something that is so so well defined and, and optimized uh, suddenly becomes a random variable. So now it's important to make sure that, okay, we are not talking now about this optimization of how this, how this B is calculating, calculated, or how your computer is calculating it. You are not going to do it by paper and pen anyway. Um, it's important to have some idea how your computer is doing it, but uh, to treat it as a random variable, like a statistician would do or econometrician, so the reason why it is a random variable is essentially that because we need to plug into this formula, we need to use this data of X and Y as, as input to this formula. So this data makes it actually a random variable because it's calculated from data. And remember, uh, even if this, these uh, explanatory variables X were somehow a priori determined in some kind of controlled experiment, uh, where experimenter could control the level of these x variables, even then this this y is a random variable because remember what the regression equation states about y. Y is this uh, uh, b1 plus b2 times x plus and so and so, and uh, there is a finally this error term. So if you think about the theoretical model, then y is equal to beta1 plus beta2 x2 and so on and so on plus epsilon. So this random variable epsilon, which is inherently included in y variable, also makes that this b, which we calculate based on this random y, is also also random variable. So y is random variable because it depends on the random variable epsilon, uh, 
and uh, and b is also there for a random variable so it's not when you when you run this uh, this um uh, regression analysis over and over again with this exact same data you will always get exact the same results however if you do some resampling so you so you sample this x and y from certain population you run a regression and then you resample these x and y from the same population again maybe you make some kind of survey and you do another survey then probably your coefficients would be different depending on which survey you have analyzed so this is why this estimator b we think about it as a random variable and it's valid to think about it as a random variable it's not some kind of uh, uh, computational errors this, there's nothing random in the computation or optimization the randomness comes from the use the fact that we have a, a data x and y and y itself is a random variable sometimes it might be x also but uh, definitely y so therefore we can also think about this this uh, when we think about b as a random variable so b must have a uh, uh, a probability distribution and by b i mean this vector b so in, it means that each uh, intercept and slope coefficient has a probability distribution and uh, if they have a probability distribution there are also some characteristics such as uh, expected value e of b and variance of b okay so now if we think about this estimated uh, uh, coefficients so what the regression analysis and what the order and least squares estimator is doing, this estimated uh, slope, which we have so far considered, we can think about those as the expected values of B. But then when we look at the variance, in fact, it's often, often useful to look at the standard deviation rather than variance. And uh, the estimated standard deviation of those coefficients is called standard error. So it's important to remember this term standard error it refers to the estimated standard deviation of those uh, regression coefficients okay that's why it is it is quite important uh, we will also then later use this uh, standard error when we do some statistical inferences for example confidence intervals for those coefficients or we test some hypothesis so the standard error is really really critical but it's also from the perspective of terminology it's uh, it's good to remember the meaning of the standard error so how does the standard error get computed in when when, we, when you run regression analysis how does the computer calculate the standard error so this is also a little bit a uh, little bit uh, tedious would require matrix algebra but to gain intuition then firstly think about uh, uh, what would be the the estimated uh, variance of the random error term epsilon that we have in this uh, this regression equation so obviously we can use the regression residuals e and and the sample variance of the of this e to to estimate the the estimate the variance of the of the uh, random term error term epsilon so in fact it turns out to be that the that the unbiased estimator is not the sample variance of the residuals uh, remember that in sample variance you would then take uh, take n minus one but rather there is a so-called degrees of freedom correction so the unbiased estimator would be to use the the sum of squares of residuals and divided by n minus capital k and capital k was the number of parameters in the model so this turns out to be an unbiased estimator of the of the of the uh, error term epsilon and i will come later back to this okay what does it mean if it is an unbiased estimator so firstly we need to we need to estimate that what is the what is the variance of the error term but also then the the standard error also depends on those explanatory variables and in the in the general case remember the standard error was estimated standard deviation so i will i will indicate the standard error by this s dot e dot bk so for the kth variable we can calculate with this kind of uh, formula with the square root and and we have the the product of the 
of the of this uh, estimated variance of the error term and there, there would be the kth diagonal element uh, of the of the inverse matrix uh, with, which depends on this uh, x variables so if you don't know matrix algebra then this this is kind of tedious and in general case it's tedious to to express this kind of formula with some notation but again my strategy is to illustrate to you how does it look like if we have just two explanatory variables x2 and x3 so in that case the formula simplifies a little bit so we can we can then calculate the standard error for for b2 so again think about this b2 as the slope for example for the size in square meters in a hedonic uh, model of housing market and now we have two regressors for example this uh, size in square meters and number of rooms so the standard error then would be the square root and uh, in the nominator we have again this uh, estimated variance of the error term which we calculate based on the regression residuals and in the denominator we have uh, n minus 1 n is the sample size uh, then we have estimated variance of the regressor x2 and we have uh, then fourth component is 1 minus uh, r2 and this r here refers to the to the sample correlation coefficient between these two explanatory variables x2 and x3 so purpose here is not to memorize by heart this kind of formula but rather to, to gain understanding of what does the sample um what does the standard error depend on when we when we calculate it from the sample so indeed this breaking it down to four different components can give you give you an idea that what does the standard error depend on so, so suppose that the question would be, how can I make, uh, make my estimator more precise? So how could I, in fact, decrease the, the, the standard error? So what does the sample, uh, what does the standard error depend on? So obviously it depends on that, how large is the, the variance of the error term epsilon. In some sense, how much noise there is in my data. The more noise in the data, the larger the standard errors also. That's the first of the four components that and now I'm thinking on this equation on the bottom. Uh, the second term in this in this product is the square root of, of uh, one divided by n minus one. So n was this number of observations in my sample. So if sample size n increases, then obviously the second component, uh, this one divided by n minus one becomes smaller and smaller. And therefore also the square root of 1 divided by n minus 1 becomes smaller. So if you want to get the smaller standard errors, if you want to get more precise results, or you want to have more significant results, increasing the sample size if possible is always a good idea. And make n as large as possible. The third one, this is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but, uh, but uh, what about sample variance? So... Uh, if I if we take uh, the the square root of of uh, one divided by sample variance of x two, then it is actually a good thing to have as as large variance as possible in my explanatory variable. Uh, so so notice that when the sample variance of x two increases, then one divided by sample variance decreases, and uh, we have a more precise estimates. So from the regression analysis point of view, it's actually good to have as large, as much variation as possible in your explanatory variable. And uh, a practical lesson would be then that, um, that for example, if you look at this, uh, think about this hedonic modeling of housing markets in SPOR. So you want to have uh, uh, as much variation in your, in your size in square meters. So you want to have small apartments, you want to have very big apartments, as much Differ, as much variation in the size of the apartments as possible. So therefore, it's not necessarily a good idea to, to restrict your sample very specific to some kind of homogeneous group of just, let's say, a certain type of apartments or, or just, just a single room apartments, because then you don't have so much variation in your, in your explanatory variable. So in practice, many people tend to have this kind of intuition that you would want to have a, have a, very homogeneous sample 
but uh, but uh, that's not really necessary in regression analysis you can you can control for the heterogeneity in many ways so rather than have some kind of for example separate models for very homogeneous subsamples it's actually better to just pull down these uh, different types of uh, observations this will help you to increase the sample size but also it increases the variation in your sample so think about the extreme case where you where you would try to estimate uh, uh, the impact of square meters on price but you would only have uh, apartments that have exactly the same uh, exactly the same uh, amount of square meters so in that case the sample variance in square meters would be equal to zero but also you cannot explain anything if there's not any 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 variation in your sample if you have very homogeneous sample you cannot really explain anything heterogeneity in your sample is good thing so finally the fourth component and this is also important when we when we think about the multiple regression is uh, notice the impact of the correlation between uh, this x2 and x3 and this r is literally the correlation coefficient that you are used to so if you if you have a, uh, if you think about correlation, this R is the measure of the correlation coefficient. So now the fourth component is the square root of uh, 1 divided by 1 minus correlation coefficient R to power 2. So what does this squared term actually mean then? So remember from, from the high school or secondary school mathematics that, uh, that this correlation coefficient uh, is normalized that it's always between minus one and one so correlation can be also negative but uh, the minimum value is minus one maximum value is one and if there's no correlation this value of correlation coefficient is equal to zero so when the correlation coefficient would be equal to zero then also its power two would be zero so then this fourth component would be just equal to one However, then, if, uh, if this correlation is, is, uh, uh, is equal to, would, let's consider the extreme case of 1, so you have perfect correlation between x2 and x3, then uh, this uh, ratio 1 divided by 1 minus r to power 2 uh, would actually uh, be undefined because you would have to divide by 0, and, uh, and 1 divided by 0 or one divided by something very close to zero would approach to infinity. So that means that if you have extremely high correlation between your explanatory variables, then the standard error would go to infinity. So that means that if you, if you have very highly correlated, uh, correlated uh, explanatory variables, intuitively it's very difficult to tell the difference. Okay, now which variable is actually explaining my dependent variable? Is it x2? Or is it rather x3 if they are almost indistinguishable? So that's why high correlation between explanatory variables is bad. The, the smaller the correlation, the smaller the standard error, more precise results. So ideally, you want to have regressions that uh, are not very highly correlated, if, if possible. But of course, uh, this is not always your choice to make, that you cannot really, really choose. So ideally, we do not have very highly correlated explanatory variables. So this is also like I have I have already mentioned that uh, that if you want to improve uh, precision in terms of standard error, then then uh, ideally you want to have uh, have this uh, uh, standard deviation of the of the error term as small as possible. So in practice, you could of course think about improving the empirical fit. So so you could. If, if possible, to add more explanatory variables that belong to the model, then that could actually help to decrease the standard error. Increasing the sample size is, is generally uh, a good idea if, if, if it's only possible. And uh, increasing the sample variance of X2 is also, also helpful. And uh, as a practical remedy to that, I, I already suggested that Rather than restrict your sample to some very homogeneous subgroup, uh, it's better idea to pull down uh, and, and then control for the heterogeneity with your explanatory variables. And then finally, uh, decrease correlation between X2 and X3. Uh, 
So I want to still talk about this correlation of x2 and x3 a little bit in more detail. So this relates to this kind of uh, problem called multicollinearity. So high correlation between explanatory variables uh, can sometimes be problematic. But uh, this is a little bit uh, a vague term in the sense, this multicollinearity, that, that there's not some kind of clear a clear cut rule that when is when is a high correlation a problem so for example in this uh, uh, sample of uh, apartments in the hedonic modeling of housing market we find that uh, that the sample correlation between size and square meters is quite highly correlated with the number of bedrooms and that's not really surprising obviously the more rooms you have then also you need to have more more square meters but uh, but uh, I also want to emphasize that the high correlation is not a problem uh, as such, because we, we do take into account this, uh, this correlation. Remember that, uh, that uh, how we calculated these uh, slope coefficients in the multiple regression. I, I walked you through this example of uh, x2 and x3 when we have uh, two explanatory variables. So we explicitly consider the sample covariance when calculating these correlations. So everything is based on these correlations in some sense. But uh, uh, sometimes if, if, if you have, of course, perfectly correlation, so if the correlation coefficient is equal to one or equal to minus one, so it can be also negative correlation, then, then uh, it can become a problem also if the sample size is relatively small, if there's not large enough variance in your explanatory variables, so all those four components that we saw in the standard error do influence this, this, uh, this issue. So in what kind of situation you might suspect that you might have multicollinearity? So um, I think this laundry list becomes more clear when we also talk about this, uh, these uh, concepts like, uh, like a coefficient of determination and so on more, more, more detail. But, uh, Firstly, if, if your model has very good empirical fit in terms of this R squared statistics or the F statistics to be discussed later, however, your coefficients have very large standard errors or they have uh, uh, clearly wrong signs or unexpected signs, then you might expect that it might be due to this uh, high correlation between your variables. So then it's a good idea to check that, okay, how big this uh, uh, correlation is and uh, clearly that if you have perfectly correlated so if this uh, these uh, two explanatory variables have correlation coefficient equal to one then you cannot cannot do ordinary least squares with this this kind of uh, variables because then the standard error would just blow up to infinity and that would be the extreme type of multicollinearity so you cannot include explanatory variables that are perfectly correlated so so uh, uh, as a simple example, if you think of the hedonic modeling of housing market, so you might have a measure the uh, measure the size in square meters, but then if you are like um, American or British, you might have some kind of square feet or some other unit of measure. But uh, this would be simply same information expressed in other other units. So so then in that case there would be perfect correlation and uh, your regression model would fail. So you cannot have uh, two variables that are perfectly correlated. Some statistical software like, uh, for example, Stata, I believe, would automatically eliminate. So if you accidentally put the two variables that are perfectly correlated, then Stata would assume that, uh, that uh, you didn't intend to may put them and it would just automatically exclude one of these uh, variables that you in indicated. But not all software are so smart uh, so, so you might also end up with some kind of error message. So, like I mentioned, uh, correlation between exploratory variables is not, uh, not necessarily a problem. And uh, when it becomes a problem, it's also not really entirely clear. Uh, some people use, for example, the so-called VIF, so variance inflation factors, but they are also to some extent just kind of descriptive statistics so you could equally well just look report the correlation coefficients for the for those variables and there is not any in to my knowledge there is not some good statistical test of uh, of multicollinearity so mainly uh, this would be something to be aware of uh, when you do some empirical modeling uh, 
that that if you have some kind of uh, uh, if you try to include in the model some uh, some explanatory variables that are perfectly correlated, then 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 this will absolutely not function. And if you have some variables that are very very highly correlated, then you should uh, uh, consider trying to eliminate one of those variables, or or somehow remodel reformulate your model so that you avoid this kind of kind of very high high correlation we will discuss some some uh, ways of that how you might do it then then a little bit later in the in the course so that's that's all i think it's important to to understand these concepts of multicollinearity and standard error and uh, and in some sense, if you think about what kind of treatments to multicollinearity, uh, before you would eliminate some variables, actually, you might also try to, to increase the standard error. So do the same kind of uh, uh, things that I suggested for increase, uh, decreasing, the decreasing the standard error so you could increase the sample size, if possible, improve the empirical fit, and so on. So... If you decide to eliminate some, some explanatory variables to deal with multicollinearity, I would advise you to be very cautious about it because then there is a problem of omitted variable bias that might, might become uh, relevant. And we will discuss that about also, also a little bit later on. So I have already referred to these concepts like, uh, like uh, R2, R2 statistic that, that measures the fit. So the topic of the next lesson is then uh, the R-squared statistic and how do we measure the goodness of fit. Thanks for your attention.